Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. My name is Katie, my pronouns are she, hers, and I'm going to be here keeping an eye out for all of your questions and comments about our animals today. If you're joining us from Facebook or YouTube, thank you so much. Uh, but unfortunately, we cannot see those questions or comments at this time. And if you are joining us on Zoom, please hit that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask us anything. Uh, if you would like to see closed captions, there's also a button down there that says see, see. So at this point, I invite our Museum of Science educators and Live Animal Care Center staff to come on and introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Corey. I'm the invertebrate keeper here at the museum. And also doing the presentation with me today is Liz, who is our assistant curator of our live animal center. So this week's theme is viewer's choice. So these are animals that um, hopefully a lot of you guys were watching last week and were able to vote on. So we're gonna go in the order of third place, then second place, then first place. You're gonna have to hang out to the end if you wanna see the first place animal that landslide took, I think it was over half of the vote. So it's a very exciting animal. So the first animal, I'm gonna have Liz turn on the camera. So this animal is a giant cave cockroach. So a lot of people may be familiar with cockroaches or the very popular Madagascar hissing cockroach. So the giant cave cockroach is a little bit different this is one of the largest species of cockroaches in the entire world. So males, the boy cockroaches, are about three inches to three and a half inches. So that is pretty much the length of top of my fingers to the bottom here. The females are about four inches. So that's from the top of my fingers, about halfway down my hand. So very, very large. These guys are from Central and South America which is really cool that they're just a little bit further south from us. These guys tend to live in, um, in like rotting logs or in caves and they are omnivores. So that means that these guys not only eat plant material, but they also eat meat. Pretty crazy, right? So these guys are more like a scavenger or a decomposer. They're not gonna be looking for animals that are alive, they're not gonna be hunting like that. They're gonna be breaking down organic material and really their main source of food is going to be plant material. One of the other things that these guys are known for eating um, and helping to break down is bat guano. And bat guano is just a fancy word for bat poop. So these guys love eating bat poop, which is a really great thing because if they didn't eat it, this bat poop would take a really long time to break down back into the soil. So these guys do a big cleanup job for us. So as you can, as you might be able to see, this cockroach does have wings, which is very different from a Madagascar hissing cockroach that doesn't have wings. So in theory, these cockroaches can take off and fly. I have to say, I've never seen this before. I've never witnessed, I've never seen a video. Um, what my assumption is that these wings are more for helping them glide down. So if they're on a roof of a cave and they fall, those wings will help them glide down uh, so they can safely land on the bottom. The female cockroaches are a little too heavy to physically take off with those wings, um, but in theory, the males can fly. So I'm actually gonna turn it over and see if anyone has any questions about our cockroaches. Sure, we have quite a few questions coming in. Uh, one question is, is it male or female? And then we also have a few for what is its name? Great questions. So this one, I am not sure if it is a male or a female. My assumption is because of size that it is a male but it's really hard to tell with cockroaches, um, especially when we're just looking at size, because just like humans, we can say uh, an average woman is about, you know, five, five, but sometimes you can have, uh, you know, people that are a lot shorter or a lot taller. We like to say averages, but we, you never know for sure because genetics are so different. So it can be hard to tell. The main way that we would have to tell is if we watch them mating, or we'd have to physically cut her open or him open. And we don't wanna do that. 
Um, this one, its name is Clarence. Um, we actually have about a hundred cockroaches that live here at the museum. Um, they breed on their own. They kind of have their own little colony. And these guys actually live on exhibit. Thank you. Uh, we have a great observation here that it looks like it has spikes on its legs. What are those about? What are those for? Yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful observation. So something else you might know about cockroaches is that they're really good at climbing. They're really good at using those legs. And it's not because they have a sticky, a super sticky pad or anything crazy on their feet. They actually use their tarsies and these little hairs on their feet to help them climb. So those spikes are actually to help them climb and um, grab on to the surfaces that they're walking on. Great, great observation. Um, they also can help if a predator is coming to eat them or pick them up, they are spiky. So Liz is feeling those on her hand right now. They're not digging in in any way, um, but she's definitely able to feel them. Thanks. Uh, and you mentioned that they're omnivores. What kind of meat does a cave cockroach eat? Great question. So these guys are pretty much going to be eating like decaying insects is really going to be their main thing. Um, occasionally you will see them on a, like a larger animal that has already died. They might be scavenging off of it a little bit and eating some of that meat, but it's going to be very rare. As you can see, Liz is holding the cockroach and it is using its, its mandibles to check out her hand. That's really to smell what's going on. It's very unlikely that this cockroach would bite, uh, would bite Liz. And that was a great example of a little flight we just had, which is pretty cool. Um, so it, it is rare that they would kind of go after or anything, even if it's already dead. So it's usually smaller decomposing material that they're breaking down. Awesome. And um, I see this question here and it's one I have as well. How far north do these get? Because we're not that far away from Central America. <laughs> yes. So these guys are definitely like the Southern part of Central America. Um, my understanding is I don't believe that they even come into Mexico. Um, again, boundaries change with animals all the time. Unfortunately, they don't want to live by our rules and just stay in specific areas that help us mark where they are. They will kind of move around, but I don't believe they're as high as Mexico. They tend to be more in like Brazil, the species specifically. Thank you. Uh, well, we have about 45 questions here. Uh, so um, I'm sorry we can't get to them all for the cave cockroach, but I think we could talk about it all day if we wanted to. Oh, yes. Let's see. Uh, can the cockroaches swim? Fantastic question. So it's a, it's a hard question to answer. So yes and no. They definitely tend to float a little bit if they are in water, but it's not great. And they can't really swim like how we think of a swimming animal. Um, they may be able to get themselves up enough to grab onto something to climb out of the water, but it would definitely be difficult uh, if they were in a river, that would probably be the end of their lives because um, they're, not, they're not meant to be aquatic. Thanks. Uh, and you mentioned predators before. What are predators that they have? Oh, anything that can get their hands on a cockroach will eat it. They are pretty much just a bag of protein. They're a great, great meal for any animal that is an omnivore or, carn or carnivore or an insectivore. So that would be birds, mammals, reptiles, some amphibians. Um, the fact that these guys are a little bit larger does help with smaller predators, um, but still anything that can get their hands on a cockroach will want to eat it. Uh, we really look at cockroaches and we kind of get this perception as, you know, when we're young, that cockroaches are gross and, you know, we don't want them around, but cockroaches are so important to our ecosystems. They break down all that gross material. If we didn't have cockroaches, our planet would be disgusting. Cockroaches are so, so, so important. Not only for that, but they're a great food source for not only other animals, but for humans. You know, humans eat cockroaches too. 
and they're a great food source. So they're so, so important for our environment. Thank you. Uh, on that very positive note, uh, I'm going to put up a slide with a bunch of our cockroach facts while our team prepares the next animal. So feel free to take a screenshot or uh, if you wanna scribble anything down to remember for next time, we have our giant cave cockroach. And the fun fact of, they can be about up to four inches long, which ooh, can't really tell in that picture, but. All right. Are we ready and switched over? I think we are just about ready for our second place viewer's choice animal. So I'm not even gonna give you uh, a preview. I'm just gonna have Corey get the camera on this animal. I guarantee you guys will know what kind of animal it is right away. This is a pretty recognizable mammal. Now this is a domestic rabbit. I'm sure most of you knew right away that it was a rabbit uh, or a bunny. Sometimes people prefer to call them that. Um, but I do specify that this is a domestic rabbit. We do actually have some wild rabbits here in the New England area. We have two different species of cottontail rabbits. Now this one actually has similar coloration to rabbits that you might see in the wild, again, here in the New England area. Now there is a distinction when I called it a domestic rabbit, they are genetically different from those wild rabbits. Now domestication is actually a process that takes thousands and thousands of years of breeding. Now this is actually a process that is done by people. Now after those thousands of years of breeding and the many generations, the animal again is genetically different than one in the wild. Now typically when we think of domestic animals, probably ones you guys first think of would be cats and dogs. And you would be absolutely correct. Those are examples of domestic animals. But then also things like rabbits, also ferrets are a domestic animal. Typically when people start this domestication process, it's because they want the animals to help them in some way. They wanna make use of them. Uh, for example, cats were domesticated to help keep rodent populations under control. So to help hunt rodents. You might wonder, what could a rabbit be used for? Well, initially when they were bred for domestication, it was for food. I know it's hard to think of, uh, imagine eating a rabbit, but they were initially bred for food and also their fur. A lot of them have really nice fur that people did like. Now we know and love having rabbits as pets. Uh, we always like to say that you want to do some homework and make sure you're prepared before you take in any animal as a pet. But now a lot of people do having them just for companionship and having them as pets. So that's a little bit about domestication. Now rabbits, one of my most favorite facts about rabbits is they are actually not rodents. Most of you have probably heard of rodents before. It's a pretty big group of mammals. Now, a lot of times people think rabbits are rodents, but they're actually not. Rabbits belong to a special group of animals called lagomorphs. I know that's a pretty big word. The only other lagomorphs, the only other relatives of rabbits are hares and then a cool animal called a pika. If you've never seen what a pika looks up, looks like, why don't you look it up on Google? Uh, they're pretty cool animals. Now lagomorphs and rodents are similar, but they're different enough that scientists have separated them when they want to classify them. So rodents have, if you kind of think of those buck teeth that rodents like mice, rats, squirrels have, these teeth are called incisors and they're the front teeth. And they actually grow throughout the entire lifetime of a rodent, kind of like our hair and our fingernails. Now lagomorphs like our rabbit here, they also have those incisors that grow throughout their entire lifetime. But 
they have an extra set of incisors. So rodents have four, two on the top, two on the bottom. Lagomorphs actually have an extra set behind the top front teeth. There's an extra smaller set behind them. So that distinction is enough that they have separated them in classification. So I always just think that's really cool. Now this specific breed of rabbit is called a mini lop. Now they get that name lop because of the way the ears come down. Usually when you think of wild rabbits, you probably think of those ears as sticking straight up and you would be correct. So there are many different breeds of rabbit, kind of like if you think of all the different breeds of dogs that you might know. Now I see we already have a good amount of questions. So why don't I turn it over to some of those? Thanks. Uh, well, we do have many people wondering, of course, does this rabbit have a name? She does have a name. Her name is actually Pancake. Um, we actually adopted this rabbit from a shelter. So someone had her as a pet and then decided they didn't want her anymore. So we actually adopted her uh, from a shelter and she came with the name. So I would like to say we could take credit for such a cute name, um, but she did come with it. And I didn't see this, but somebody is asking, did the, did the rabbit have toilet paper and why did it have toilet paper? That was a very astute observation. Um, so I, I, we actually had that paper towel roll. It was set up to prop our camera for our last animal. <laughs> so you, you did see her kind of go up to it when she first got put on the cart. Um, but Corey moved it out of the way because she didn't want to distract her too much. <laughs> very good observation. Yeah, very careful observation. Thank you. Um, there is a question here about rabbits' ears. Do some rabbits have ears that flop down and some that stick up? And why are they either up or down? So since this is a domesticated animal, people over the thousands of years can breed for different physical characteristics, if that makes sense. So if you think about it, think about how different all the different kinds of dogs look. Think of something like a Doberman, a German Shepherd, and a little Chihuahua. That's what the years and years of breeding can do. So typically wild rabbits, um, for the most part, will have those ears straight up. So this, again, the mini lop, it was something that was bred for. I'm not really sure why, to tell you the truth, um, maybe just because someone thought it was cute and decided that they wanted to keep that trait going. Um, so it is a little complicated and does take lots and lots of breeding. Um, but most wild rabbits will have their ears uh, that stick straight up. That's sort of the, the natural uh, stance of the ears. And we have some more questions about senses here. How is the eyesight in domesticated rabbits? And also, do they have whiskers and what do they use them for? They do have whiskers. I think, I don't know if Corey's quite close enough, but they do have whiskers. Um, they're used for sensation. So kind of feeling their way around them. Um, their eyesight is sort of the typical, we say this for prey animals, that their eyes are more on the side of their head. So they're really good at peripheral vision. Uh, so even though it's a domestic rabbit and it doesn't have to protect itself or worry about predators, um, it is still similar enough to its wild relatives that the eyes are on the side of the head. So they have a really big peripheral range so they can sense if anything is nearby coming at them. Uh, the one blind spot would be right in front of their face. Uh, that's a little bit harder for them to see, but they do have a really wide peripheral range. She looks like she's taking a really good look at us right now. <laughs> and actually, we're getting a good view of those whiskers right now. So cute. What, uh, what kind of food do they eat? And do they eat carrots? <laughs> they do like carrots. Um, they're not always the best for them to eat all the time. So actually, the main part of the diet is actually hay. Uh, so kind of dried grass is called Timothy hay. Um, that is the bulk of a domestic rabbit diet. Uh, in addition, they also eat rabbit pellets. So it's a pelleted food that's just kind of like crushed vegetation. 
Uh, and she does have some greens. I think she was nibbling on a few at some point a little uh, while earlier. Um, she has things like kale, dandelion greens, romaine. Um, so those are a smaller part of her diet. Again, hay and then the pellets are the bigger part. Rabbits in the wild are herbivores. So they will eat uh, pretty much any vegetation, grasses they can come upon. Thank you so much. All right, I have a slide here with a bunch of that information. So I can put that up and we can take a closer look at pancake while our team goes and grabs the next animal. Thank you very much to Liz and Pancake. We have information here about where they live, both the domesticated rabbit and wild rabbits in the area, and also what they eat, which we were just talking about. And also just a very nice picture of Pancake. And for our fun rabbit fact, a whole group of rabbits is called a fluffle, which is just a pretty nice word. All right, team. All right, we are just about ready for our first place animal in our viewer's choice. And like Corey mentioned at the beginning, this animal was so popular that it got over half the votes. So all the other animals combined uh, had uh, less votes than this one animal. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna have Corey turn the camera on and introduce it. And of course the animal is starting to hide in a tunnel the exact moment of her uh, debut. So this is an animal called an African pygmy hedgehog. And I promise it'll be worth the wait. She will wander out of that tube at some point and it will be completely adorable. There she is. Now I specify African and pygmy for hedgehogs. Sometimes you'll hear them also called four-toed hedgehogs. There are hedgehogs in other parts of the world. So there are European hedgehogs that actually get much larger than this. That's why they call it a pygmy. Uh, that generally means small. So this is a full-size adult hedgehog. So they weigh under a pound at full size. So that's why people typically think they're pretty adorable because they are pretty small animals. Now, a lot of times when people see a hedgehog, they often know what it is right away. Sometimes people confuse hedgehogs with maybe some other spiky animals. Sometimes people think it might be a small porcupine. Now porcupines and hedgehogs are actually very different. The easiest way to tell the difference would just be size. Porcupines are actually really large animals. Even a newborn porcupine would be much bigger than this adult pygmy hedgehog. They're also in completely different groups of animals. So they are both mammals, but porcupines are one of those rodents. I know I was talking about rodents a little bit earlier. Hedgehogs are in a different group of mammals. They're insectivores. So their relatives are more things like moles and shrews. Their teeth are very different from those kind of buck teeth that I was talking about earlier. Now, both porcupines and hedgehogs are spiky. So that is definitely something they have in common. But those spikes or what they use to protect themselves are a little bit different. Porcupines have quills. Some of you may have heard that term before. Quills are kind of loosely attached to the porcupine and they actually can come out of them. You have to touch a porcupine for the quills to come out, but they can come out pretty easily. Hedgehogs have spines. Those are a little bit different. They're also spiky, but they don't come out as easily. They may shed them occasionally like our hair can shed, but they don't come out. That's not really how they're made. So the way a hedgehog defends itself, unfortunately, you're not gonna get to see it because our hedgehog is really friendly and she doesn't feel the need to defend herself right now. But when a hedgehog gets nervous or feels a predator maybe coming after it, you see all those spines on the back of the hedgehog, they have a muscle on their back that kind of works like a drawstring. So they curl their bodies up really, really tightly. They take their nose and they stick it behind their back legs. They curl up into a tight little ball. 
If you'll notice kind of that lighter fur that you can see on the underside of the hedgehog, that fur is soft. So their underside is really soft. So when they curl themselves up like that, basically the only thing sticking out are those spines. Another thing hedgehogs do, if an animal comes over to them and maybe sniffs at them, they actually make some pretty, pretty scary noises. They hiss, they grunt, so that might scare the animal. They also shake a little bit when they make those noises. So it kind of pushes those spines against the animal if it's sniffing at them. So it's a pretty good defense. Again, you're not gonna see that defense in action because she is a pretty friendly little hedgehog. Now I know we only have a couple minutes left, so why don't I turn it over to some questions? Sure. Uh, so it actually looks like the hedgehog might be using its nose right now. We have a couple questions uh, for why is its nose so long and skinny? Yeah, so a lot of times animals with a long snout have a pretty good sense of smell. So that's a great observation. Hedgehogs do not have the best eyesight, so they really do rely on that sense of smell. They eat a lot of insects. In fact, you guys are, have seen our hedgehog eat several mealworms. There she goes, one right there. So she really is using that sense of smell uh, to sniff out those mealworms rather than her eyesight. And uh, speaking of maybe not so much what it eats, but what might be looking for it, what are its predators in the wild? So again, hedgehogs do a pretty good job of defending themselves with those spines, but they certainly are going to have predators. Birds of prey are probably going to be a big one because uh, they have those really sharp talons. So if they're able to surprise a hedgehog and get at it maybe before it's able to curl up, uh, that would definitely be a big predator, things like hawks. Any large mammal is certainly going to try um, but a lot of animals are discouraged, again, by that curling up. They're not willing to wait for the hedgehog to uncurl, and it is difficult for them to get through those spines. Are there different kinds of hedgehogs that live in different parts of the world? And we do have a question if they can be found in North America. We actually do not have North American hedgehogs. Uh, sometimes people call an animal that is known as a woodchuck or a groundhog. Sometimes people refer to that as a hedgehog, um, but it's not truly a hedgehog. Um, so we actually don't have any that live here in North America. Um, but there are, again, the African pygmy hedgehog, which is the one you're meeting right now. And then there are also some hedgehogs that live in Europe. So there are hedgehogs in different parts of the world. If you're thinking of uh, a hedgehog as a pet, it would be this species. So maybe if someone you know has a hedgehog, it's this kind of hedgehog. Uh, that's typically the one you see in the pet trade. And uh, I have two questions left. Uh, do you know where the name hedgehog comes from? I'm actually not sure. Uh, that's a great question. I don't know who first <laughs> described it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure of the origin of the name. Uh, I mean, you might find them around hedges. Uh, so maybe the person who first described them just kind of was like, oh, that thing kind of looks like a hog. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. And then, of course, we have many people who are interested to know in what the name of this particular hedgehog is. Her name is Zuri, and I know the age question usually follows. She is actually just about four years old. Her birthday is coming up in early April. Well, happy almost birthday to Zuri. Uh, and with that, I think we need to say goodbye to our uh, pygmy hedgehog, because we are out of time. Uh, and I do have, a Goodbye to Liz, thank you so much. Thank you to Liz and Corey. I do have a slide here with facts about Dio, our, oh, I have the wrong name, I'm so sorry. Zuri, our hedgehog, including where they live and what they eat and what their lifespan is. We also have a fun fact if it'll pop up which is that uh, they can make a frothy liquid with their spit and spread it over their spines, which is called self-anointing. 
And I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you for being amazing scientists, making wonderful observations and asking amazing questions. If you'd like to join us again, please visit mos.org slash mos at home uh, and to see, to see the rest of our schedule coming up. And of course, if you would like to support us, please uh, visit engage.mos.org slash welcome. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you next time.